Hi everyone, welcome back to Strategic Management. Today we're going to talk about one of the oldest and well-known frameworks for strategic analysis, Porter's Five Forces, only we're going to deal with six forces. Porter's original framework included five forces, the degree of existing rivalry, threat of entry, bargaining power of suppliers, bargaining power of buyers, and threat of substitutes. Later, however, he acknowledged a sixth force, the role of complements. Let's start by looking at how we analyze the degree of existing rivalry. Some of the most important factors that we consider when we're evaluating the degree of existing rivalry include demand growth, concentration, product differentiation, excess capacity and exit barriers, and cost conditions. Let's start with demand growth. When the whole market is growing, individual firms can grow without having to fight to take share away from each other. Thus, the rivalry might not feel very intense. On the other hand, when the market is mature or in decline, firms may have to fight to take share away from each other to grow, and that's going to put pressure on prices. Now let's talk about the effect of market concentration. The most concentrated markets are called monopolies, and this is when one company controls an overwhelming share of the market. These markets face very little price pressure at all. The opposite end of the spectrum is a fragmented market, where there are lots of small players competing vigorously, which often has considerable price competition. A third important kind of market is called the oligopoly. An oligopoly is when you have a small number of very large players. These markets can act like monopolies when there's tacit coordination and agreement not to compete on price among them, or they can be viciously price competitive with price wars that lead to serious losses. Next, let's talk about product differentiation. When you have low product differentiation, such as in the market for all-purpose flour, you often have vigorous price competition because even though you can brand the products differently and there might be minor differences, customers perceive the products as being pretty similar and they won't pay significantly more for one brand versus another. By contrast, when you have a market with high product differentiation, such as the market for sports cars, customers are likely to have a very strong preference for one product over the other. This means the products aren't competing directly on price, and they can sustain higher margins. Now let's talk about excess capacity and exit barriers. Sometimes industries end up with excess capacity because demand has gone into decline or because firms built production capacity too quickly. This puts heavy pressure on prices, and firms might want to shut down some of that capacity, but sometimes they face large exit barriers like investments that can't be recouped, union contracts, or pension commitments. Last but not least, the degree of existing rivalry is also influenced by cost conditions. If costs are mostly variable, like at a bagel store, a firm can scale back those costs if demand decreases, so it won't discount price below costs. On the other hand, if costs are mostly fixed, like at an airline, a firm could end up having to discount price below cost if demand decreases, because after all, you do not want to fly a half-empty airplane. Now let's talk about threat of entry. To assess the threat of entry, we have to look at two main things. First, what attracts entrance to the industry? And second, how high are the barriers to entry? If the industry isn't attractive, you don't really need entry barriers. But if the industry is really attractive, the barriers will make a big difference. Things that tend to attract potential entrants include profits, growth, and intrinsic sex appeal. Barriers to entry include things like high upfront capital costs, patents, and government regulation. Now let's talk about the factors that influence the bargaining power of suppliers to the industry. For example, suppose we're Starbucks and some of our suppliers include coffee bean suppliers, dairy suppliers, and baristas. For each of these categories, we're going to ask, how reliant are we on particular suppliers? Are there very few suppliers or are they highly differentiated? We also want to know if we face switching costs to change suppliers. Can they credibly threaten to forward vertically integrate into our business? These things will increase their power. On the other hand, we'll also ask how reliant suppliers are on particular buyers like us and whether we can credibly threaten to backward vertically integrate into their business. These things will lower their bargaining power. We use a similar structure of questions to analyze the bargaining power of buyers from the industry. 
For example, let's use Starbucks again, and now our buyers are individual consumers and grocery stores. We're going to ask how reliant buyers are on us. Do they have very few choices, or are their choices highly differentiated? Do they face switching costs to change who they buy from? Can we credibly threaten to forward vertically integrate and get into their business? Each of those things will decrease their bargaining power. On the other hand, we'll also ask how reliant we are on particular buyers. Does one or a few account for a large portion of our sales? And can they credibly threaten to backward vertically integrate into our business? Those things will increase their bargaining power. Now let's analyze the threat of substitutes. Substitutes are things that aren't in your industry but serve a similar function for the customer. For example, cars versus trains in achieving transportation, or getting your caffeine from coffee or an energy drink, or getting your hair colored at a salon or using a boxed hair color. The threat of substitutes increases when substitutes are similar or better in functionality and when they're similar or lower in price. For example, boxed hair color might be lower in price and more convenient. On the other hand, the outcome might be a little bit riskier. And finally, we have the role of compliments. The value of many goods depends on the availability of compliments, like games for your Xbox, a charging station for your electric vehicle, and buffalo sauce for your veggie chicken nuggets. The role compliments play in the industry depends on the degree of dependence, the quality range and price of available compliments, and the ability of complementers to appropriate the value in the industry. For example, the lack of charging stations initially made the EV industry less attractive. On the other hand, there's plenty of good buffalo sauce alternatives for your nuggets. And now you know how to do an analysis with Porter's Five Forces plus compliments. Just for fun, here's an analysis of the retail furniture industry from the perspective of IKEA. You can screenshot it and go through it at your own speed. And here's one of the auto manufacturing industry. If you have any questions, just post them in the comments and I'll try to get back to you. If you enjoyed this video or found it useful, please hit like and subscribe to get updates on future videos. Thanks.